Voice FM. So, on the other side of my screen, on the left or right, depending where you're looking, um, it's Charlie McIntyre. He is a water bicycle player playing for England. And uh, what club do you play for in Italy? Uh, I play for a team called Dinamo Sassari. Okay, well, that one then. Um, <laughs> welcome along, Charlie. Cheers. Thank you very much for having me. Um, so, you, first of all, we just what exactly is your disability? Because there's no, there's no, there's nothing mentioned online anywhere about it. <laughs> so, exactly. uh, so I've got uh, two hip disabilities. One I was diagnosed when I was. Oh God, we're going back too far here. Maybe six. I'm gonna say, but it might be seven. But around that age. Um, so okay. it's Perfis disease. And then I was diagnosed, uh, in my, that's in my right hip. And then in my left hip, I've got something, there's a really long medical name, but I don't really know exactly what it is, but the doctors call it Sufi, um, which my doctor has been a doctor for however many years and he's only had one other case in like 50 years with like the two together. Normally you get one in both hips or the other. Uh, and I got one of each. So it's quite a special little thing. Um, and then I've also got the lower part of my spine. There's a, I've had a few problems just because of, I think, being in a wheelchair every day. You know, it kind of messes up your structure a little bit. But, yeah, so. Fair enough. Um, I, might, I, might, I might have to get you to spread that out for me later on. But that's yeah, of course. <laughs> um, and so uh, with, that wasn't, you, you weren't born with it. It just happened naturally. Yeah, so it's a bit of a weird, well, not weird, I guess, but I guess there's loads of things like it, but it just kind of happens. So um, I noticed that I, I used to be really active as a kid playing football loads. Like I got into the academy at Chelsea and stuff, like loved my football. Um, and after every session, I'd go on like pretty much in tears of agony, like mum and dad, like my legs are killing. I never felt anything in my hip. It was always my knees or my ankle. And just every time, every night, like, couldn't sleep. And uh, my mum and dad took me to the hospital and they kind of said it was just an injury for a football, which, because I'd never I'd never stop, it just got worse and worse and worse and worse. And it's just my body telling me, you need to, like, relax. Um, and they kind of put a lot of it on my mum and dad saying, like, you know, you need to control him, you need to stop him doing stuff. And obviously, as a young kid, like whatever your parents say to stop it never is going to happen you just keep going keep going um and then it kind of got to the point where the pain i was in it just weren't like normal like it it weren't just the sprain what the hospital were telling us like that's what my mum and dad believed um and you know they, they took because it's weird because they it's not like if you go in the hospital for a heart attack they do a set procedure like of testing like with me with my disability they don't they don't know what to look for so they just kind of right, you've got a sprain, get on with it. Um, and then maybe a year after that, my mum and dad took back, like, look, it's really not right. Like, he can't sleep, he's in pain, he's struggling to walk, struggling to do everything he used to be able to do, no problems. So they kind of, they then finally done MRIs and x-rays and all the normal stuff and they found, they found my disability, luckily. Well, yeah. Yeah. Um, it seems to be quite rare then. It was only two in 50 years. Well, so the problems on their own are not super unrare. Like, say, per Perfis disease, for instance, you know, if you catch it early enough and the doctors spot it early enough, there's a good chance that they can, like, fix it relatively well and you can walk and do pretty much everything what, like, a normal yeah. person can do. Um, but because mine just got left for so long, I've now got, like, the worst stage of it. Um and it's kind of rare because you know either get either just Sufi or and then or just Perth is not one of each. So that's the that's the rare bit. Um, I like to be special, and you know that's one of the parts <laughs> of it. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, and so how is it now? I mean, do you still go to hospital for some sort of injections or treatment? Um, so well, I kind of have to 
go, I had loads of operations in quite a short amount of time, always out of school for this operation, this operation to try and manage it. Um, and it's kind of got to a point now where I can't have anything more done unless I, I get hip replacements and that kind of thing. I, I, there's no more procedure wise to help fix it. Um, so I go up for checks maybe once a year just to make sure it's not getting massively worse or, you know, like when I, when I had like a growth spurt, that, that or it get a little bit worse. And then they were cautious about that. You know, I'm, I'm happy with what I'm doing. Fair enough. Um, and so it was, you, you got in, introduced to Borja Bicycle, um, from, uh, a, a former Paralympian in Richard Chris, Ch Chrisio, Ch uh, Ch Chisario, I think, I maybe. Think. <laughs> yeah, so he came in to do a presentation at your school, didn't he? Yeah, I, I, well, I tell everyone that I think my school done it on purpose, but I genuinely don't know if they did. But I feel like it makes it a cuter story if I say that it was on purpose. So, uh, uh, when I kind of got my disability, my prior were really, really amazing with my disability as they possibly could do. Um, and they brought in Richard to do, uh, I, I guess it, a lot of uh, primary schools have some kind of version of it where they do, they get like a sportsman and they do a little workshop and it normally has nothing to do with the sport they do, but they say it's like going to make you an athlete kind of thing. Um, and I, I had a similar thing to that, but he bought his basketball wheelchair in and was like, oh, sit in it, have a go. And like, I was whizzing about in it and had loads of fun. And then he gave me an envelope at the end of the day. And at the first session I had, I remember, it was the they double actually playing a basketball. We went into a, a tiny little like cupboard room with carpet on the floor, like things everywhere. You couldn't even really move, but and it was just bouncing a ball, passing to each other. And for some reason, I then decided I really enjoy basketball. I mean, you throw us a bit there, so I'm not sure about that though. Oh. but that's fine. I've got the gist of it. Uh, <laughs> and so, so, one year was that? Was that was that when you were still at primary school? Yeah, yeah. So that was all at primary school. Uh, so I think I got into basketball may, uh, maybe the age of seven or like seven or eight, maybe. Yeah, that's what um, Eastwood Academy you were at. Uh, uh that was my uh, secondary school. So my oh. primary, uh, uh, yeah, my uh. The school I found basketball at was a, a school called Ells Hall, um, and they were brilliant. I'm just going to see if, because my Wi-Fi in my apartment is awful, so I'm going to try and switch over to my hotspot. Oh, that's fine. Sorry, sorry, I've joined during my phone hotspot just because this might mean the Wi-Fi is a little bit better, so hopefully it won't count as much. Sorry about that's that. That's fine. That's fine. It just can be a bit temperamental. No, it's fine, it's fine. There you go. So, um, we got as far as I've ended up Paralympian in your school, that's right. Um, yep. And then, so, going back a bit, um, how how was the school and your friends and your teachers, how did they react to you since the... Um, since the yeah, um, so I got really lucky to be there because I, even from primary school to secondary school, I pretty much had the exact same friend, friendship groups. Uh, kind of really stressing about fitting in was never a massive problem. And like, sometimes I can be a bit shy, but most of the time I'm quite an out there person. Like, if someone's going to laugh at me for being in a wheelchair, it'll probably be myself anyway. So I like, I kind of always do that just so then people haven't got a reason to then laugh at me anyway because it ruins their fun if they're taking the mick out of someone who takes the mick out of themselves a bit I think um but so my primary school like well I owe the uh, 
them quite a bit for getting me into basketball. So they were really amazing with it. Um, my secondary school, they were good, but I wouldn't say they were as good as my primary school, if I'm honest. Like, you know, a lot of PE sessions, it's sit on the side and ref or oh, watch everyone else play. And, you know, like kind of the stories you hear from every other person who's disabled and plays sport, who is more than capable to join in with the other children, but for some reason they're not allowed. Um, but, and then I went to sixth form and there I didn't really play basketball because I kind of wanted to get my study done. And like, I played basketball outside of school, but because I was at sixth form and I had to join a different school for sixth form, I like, I didn't really pressure them to make me play. And I didn't choose uh PE as an A-level. I'd done other subjects. So it weren't a massive stress, but they were really good with the disability side of things and the access. Like they, they were really good. Uh, were they all mainstream schools, I'm assuming? Uh, yeah, yeah, all mainstream schools, yeah. Uh, so I went to Elvis Hall for, uh, what, what's what's the first school you joined? Uh, primary school, that's the one. Uh, then Eastwood Academy for secondary school, and then I went to uh, uh, St Thomas More's for sixth form, which is uh, a Catholic school. But, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, and so the, the wasn't, and the conversation with the parents about going, maybe going into a disabled school or a mainstream with a disabled unit or something like that? There was no... No, because, you know, I'm always, like, quite an independent person. Like, I'd always try and make it work. And, you know, I've I've always got the attitude, like, as long as, like, a school, for instance, are willing to just give me something back, I'm more than happy to, like, sacrifice. Like, for instance, I never went on school trips because I weren't allowed because of the wheelchair. But... Like, you know, I'm not that bothered as long as they don't put a classroom upstairs what I can't get to. So, you know, there's kind of, if I have to give up stuff, as long as like they can also try and make it work as much as they can. I I never kind of had a thought of doing anything like that, no. Um, and then you're, you, you mentioned that you did basketball outside of school and then you stopped when you were doing your basic A-levels and all that. Um, so how did we just plan the fun at first uh, when did um, we well oh yeah obviously to begin with it just started out as fun you know you never when anyone starts anything you never realize what uh like corridors it could possibly open but i mean i'm always quite a competitive kid like even board games i want to win like i've always i hate losing i'm a bad well i'm not <laughs> a bad loser but i hate losing it's yeah. Uh, yeah. So I've kind of, I've always, whenever I've played, I've wanted to compete. I've wanted to be good at it. But, you know, kind of the ceiling I set myself was never there from the beginning because obviously you don't know. As a little kid, you don't know where things are going to go. And like, even with the sport, I didn't know what the sport had for me to offer. So I didn't know. Um, but I'd say, I think I knew I wanted to do this before then. But I think a good turning point in my life was COVID. I think. Like, COVID was the first time because I had loads of time on my hands. I started training like an athlete, like indoors, obviously, like in home. We had an indoor, indoor gym sorted and I'd train, 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 work out, work out, work out. So I got probably in quite a good physical shape by the end of the pandemic. Um, like before then, I, I knew basketball was what I wanted to do. But I think in terms of maybe my mindset sh shifted was, right, the pandemic's here. I've got so much time to train and put time into it so I think that's when I probably did uh, and you got bronze at the Commonwealth Games uh, big moment yeah. yeah massive uh you know it was kind of when I first got selected I don't think I realized how like incredible it was I was a bit like oh yeah it's pretty cool it is what it is like you know it's just basketball and I think when I was playing in the Commonwealth, I still tried to stick that mindset that it's just basketball. And like, I'm 17 playing a, an international tournament in front of thousands of people, like just go there and play. Um, but I think for me, it was such a big thing. Like my parents put in so much time and effort, give up so much of their, like, like my parents are quite young and they give up so much of their like youth adulthood as if you want to put it into my own life and taking the, me to training and all sorts like that where, like when I got there, I had a moment. Where I did just sit there and think, you know, I've I'm starting to repay my parents almost for putting in all that effort and 
like it was such a big thing to put on the England jersey and yeah, it just felt like I was finally rewarding everyone who'd put so much time into me. And that was after came up, wasn't it? That was just Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so f- I think maybe a year afterwards, maybe. Yeah, it all molds into one. <laughs> and then shortly after that, who got a BBC Young Sports Personality of the Year Award. That must have yep. that's a, that's when I first took notice of you actually. <laughs> but yeah, that must have been a good way. I achieve them because um I don't think a lot of people would know about Muda Basketball and then putting you together in the same sentence and then go to such a big event like that. Yeah. Well I think again, I think at the center of the court I didn't realise how incredible it was before I was there. Like I'm I'm the first ever wheelchair basketball player to ever be nominated for the final three. And, you know, like that, when I think of some of the players Great Britain have had over the years of wheelchair basketball players, like there are some incredible athletes, like uh, just in the wheelchair basketball section. So that's without obviously other sports. And, you know, to be the first person in my own sport to go there and get nominated for it, even though I'm unfortunate I didn't win it, it's still like, you know, out of all the athletes in the world and able-bodied, disabled, like, my name is in that mix of people. And I think after, like, my mum and dad were trying to keep going on at me about how amazing it was. Like, yeah, yeah. And then after a few years, I said, I was like, do you know what? It is pretty amazing, really. You know, my name is in, in the conversations with, like, the Phil Foden's, the Ellie Sim, like, people who are, like, you know, kind of icons in their respective sports. And, like, my name's up there, which... You know, hopefully we can follow their footsteps and someone then in a few years goes, wow, that guy was really cool too. Oh, cool. And probably the coolest thing you've done is probably moved over to Italy. Um, of course, just turned 18 at that point, so that must have been quite a different shift for you. Yeah, definitely. You know, for... All my friends were like after we finished our levels, we're either going off to work or university, and I was I was going to go to university, and then I I've never not liked school. Like I've always quite enjoyed it. I I'm not one of these people who who hate it. Like I think it's all right. You get what you deserve. I think, and you know, I I enjoyed it, but I kind of got to a point where I knew I was done with it. I knew I didn't want to learn things what I'm not too interested in, and I knew basketball was what I wanted to do and I got the opportunity and uh, we played for a team I played for in England last season. We went to a few European competitions and luckily I'd done really well in them, which got my name out there. And then finally, uh, I've ended up here, which is pretty good. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, I'm, I'm really glad to be here. You know, the weather's pretty decent and... The lifestyle is really relaxed and nice, and the basketball is a whole new level compared to England. So, how did the team in Italy approach you? I mean, presumably, presumably you were playing for a club here. Yeah, um, so I was playing for a team called London Titans, who play in the top division in England. Uh, I really loved my time there. It was like they helped me. I only played with them for one season, but. The stuff I learned in that season, playing in the top division in England, I think got me into a good rhythm and a good platform to be here. Um, I got, well, the so I got quite a few different offers from different countries, and I chose to come here just because the coach is from England. He's the coach I had at the Commonwealth Games, and I have a really good relationship with him. And you know, I really I I put a lot. Well, I he, he, I trust him a lot with everything and. You know, even though I know he can get me a better basketball, I also know that for my first time moving away, he'll also look after me a bit and make sure I'm okay, which he has done. And is there a contract, like football, in football time, is there a contract for you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've got a a two-year contract here. So at the moment, I'll be here next season as well. Um, And then after that, we can look to see what's next after that. Fair. Um. I mean, I was challenged from obviously me being packing flights, going over because I know the flights are ridiculous for some, <laughs> and especially going abroad, it's quite a monumental task. So I'm assuming the parents have to fly. What was the whole thing like? 
Well, they my, well, my parents are amazing, like the most supportive people I like have in my life. But I think airport wise, I'm again, you know, you kind of you put your wheelchairs in the airport security hands, and there's nothing else you can do. You just got to pray everything makes their one piece and makes it there. The so, massive touch wood and every bit of wood which is near me right now i've had no problem so far so hopefully that continues yeah and and was there um what sort of tips would you give um obviously your condition kind of quite rare but for anyone who's in the band of water anyway um any tips or um advice you would give anyone with a disability Especially travel, maybe, or something? Yeah. Um, I I mean, I probably need to do this more than I'm going to preach, but try not to stress. Like, a lot of things aren't in your control. Like, for instance, airports, you know, as much as it should never happen, because these are our legs, if you want to put it, like, they should, wheelchairs should never be broken, but also you can't do anything about them being broken. Like, you know, you've got to, I'd say, don't be scared of doing it. I think... You hear a lot of stuff about the bad stuff, but I don't think that's every case. You know, it's about anything in life. The the news and media pick up on the bad stuff and, you know, just go and do it. Like, if you want, like, for me, obviously, I have a lot of experience with sports. So if you want to try a new sport, just go and do it and, like, fully throw yourself at something is my best advice. You know, like, if you have a passion, it doesn't matter where you're going to end up. Like, for me... If all I get to is how good I am now at basketball, I don't ever progress. I'm doing something I love to do every day. I'm getting to travel the world. And, like, you don't have to know what the next five steps of the future are. You can only live now and go and try and do as much as possible. And don't be scared at the look you get. It's, like, it's okay. Well, it's funny you say everything but now because I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to talk about it. <laughs> um, so... What's the future looking for you? I mean, obviously, it's, it's at the moment, but um, would you be looking into being the best basketball player there is? Or, um, you know, what's the... <laughs> well, of course, you know, I've got to keep uh, the wheels on the floor and try and stay, like, as level-headed as possible at all times and, like, just take steps and steps and steps and... You know, that's kind of what I want to do in my career, just slowly build up, build up, build up. And yes, one day I want to be the best player in the world. Like, you know, I, I've i given up a lot to move away from family and friends and my whole life in England. So for me, I don't want to just be here and this is my ceiling. I want to break all the next five ceilings and more. Um, but obviously I can't tell you exactly what's going to happen because I genuinely don't have a clue. But, uh, you know, I want to... I want to keep being able to wake up and do something I love to do every day uh, and keep just trying to be the best best me I can possibly be, you know, and as long as I keep sticking with that, whatever happens, happens. And what's your, what's your position on the pitch? Um, so I'm like a guard sort of player, so I'm, mm. a, I'm on the ball a lot, playmaking and shooting and that kind of jazz. Fair enough. Because I know nothing about what I suppose. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's all very good. Um, 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 you're not related to Malcolm McIntyre, are you? No, no, <laughs> unfortunately not. <laughs> That's a shame. <laughs> yeah. Um, but and um, so, what would you? What would you think? What would you think your career would be if? You weren't that interested in water basketball in the first place. If you hadn't met that Paralympian at, at school about 20 years ago for you. Do you know what? I genuinely have no idea. Like, I always, before I decided to move abroad to play basketball professionally, it was always such a big thought in my head. Like, what would I want to do if I weren't playing basketball? And I genuinely don't know. Like, I... I think maybe because I've always, well, I've had basketball for as long as I can remember. I've always loved it and wanted it. So I think I've kind of always put a lot of my eggs in one basket and never looked elsewhere. I mean, me and my like childhood best friend, we had a dream of opening a restaurant together and being chefs. So I can give that as an answer, but I don't know if that was just because we were very young. 
Um, but like serious career wise, I genuinely wouldn't have a clue. So, and um, when you started looking in the world of basketball, um, did you have to travel the country or was that like a local team to you? Or... Yeah, well, so, uh, like this is a big thing that when my career is done, I want to try and improve for the disabled community, I guess, as you put it, because I got really lucky. My parents would drive me 45 minutes every week to training, like, and that was for the first team I played for. That's the closest team. But doing that every week, you know, a lot of parents, because financial, financially or, you know, they've got other children to worry about. They cut, like, my, I've got a sister, but luckily she's a little bit older. And, like, you know, so my parents put in ridiculous miles all the time traveling, me, uh, traveling with me to places. And, you know, so it, it's really difficult. And so this is how I want to improve is in a lot of towns in England, there's loads of places where you could easily start up something for disabled people. But for some reason... No council seems to be bothered to do it and no one else seems to be that bothered about it. And that's something that I feel very passionately about is trying to trying to get other people into sport because not everyone has the chance to do stuff they love if it's not accessible. And we've already got a massive barrier in the fact that we've got social like perceptions of disabled people. We've got so many other things to worry about. And then you think, well, oh, then to just go out and do exercise, you have to drive an hour. Like, to me, it's crazy. And I'm very fortunate that my parents did it, but a lot of parents wouldn't. Move over, Lord Cole. Are you personally... <laughs> 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 you sound like you should be a politician. Making the world a better place. <laughs> well, I think then I wouldn't be called a politician, would I? Well, I don't think they do much. I haven't said anything that's untrue yet, have you? So that's all right. No. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm doing better than they are. <laughs> um, is there anything else that you wanted to say or anything in your butcher career, unbothered career you want to say or anything? Not overly, you know. Again, for people looking to get into it, just, like, try and try and get to a club or it doesn't have to be basketball. It could be any sport or, you know, like, just really engage yourself in it like like love it and I think sometimes I can be I can be bad at this but when you start you know getting up a ladder in the sport as well never forget why you actually play it and that is because you enjoy it like it doesn't matter who you want to be and where you want to get to just remember the little kid who started well that's a quite end that's the great thing to end on so thank you very much for coming on, Charlie. It's great to have you us. And I um, hope your career goes to some step and I will definitely look at me keeping an eye on you. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you very much. Voice. Let's go. Voice FM.